Well, good morning. It's exciting to see every one of y'all this morning. I have a passage um, from Ephesians chapter 2, probably my favorite chapter in the whole Bible, um, personally. Um, This is in verse 11. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's exciting news that we who are really just filthy Gentiles that had no um, deserving of God's grace have been given it. For only one reason is that Jesus loves us, right? And we come to worship him this morning because of that. Amen? So a couple of uh, announcements for you that you'll notice on your bulletin. Um, We're having a retirement celebration for Dr. Berger on Saturday, October 25th at 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You'll try to make yourself available for that. Um, just to kind of send him off as uh, this final October. When is his last day in October? Do you know? Tuesday. So, um, he is, he is finishing out, and so this is kind of just a, a celebration of, uh, of retirement in him. Also, uh, don't forget the uh, Harvest Nights and the Trunk with Treats, October 29th. That's the Wednesday before Halloween. Uh, we're going to have the Cary Jazz Band and uh, food. We're going to have uh, the trunks with treats and all kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be a real exciting time for our community and for, for us as a church. I'm getting real excited about it. In fact, if you are in any way interested in helping out, if you're doing a trunk, uh, if you're interested in still doing a trunk, we're still taking those. Um, any kind of interest whatsoever, you want to be in the prayer tent, do registration. I don't know, if you just want to be there, you know, um, Cassie and I will be down here up front at the uh, end of the service. We're just going to meet for about five minutes, okay? So if you're in any way interested in uh, helping out with uh, the harvest night, uh, just come down here at the very front right after the service, and we'll meet for just a few minutes. Also, we're still taking some candy up. I've gotten some donations from a few of y'all, and uh, we just want to, we're still taking that in. So if you want to just give some candy or whatever, just um, you can do that as well. Just come see me. Uh, If you're visiting with us today, we're excited that you're with us. Uh, some guys are walking down the aisle right now, and they have a bulletin in their hand. Um, and in that bulletin is a little tear-off tab, uh, which is some basic information. If you're visiting with us, if you will just tear that off and fill it out and either place it in the offering plate or uh, leave it on your seat after the service. Um, it's just a way that we can get to know you, see how we can serve you a little better. And... Uh, just get to know you. Um, if you're visiting or if, you're, if you just give these guys attention, uh, church members, let's stand. Say hey to somebody you hadn't said hey to this morning.
Jesus Christ today. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, nations rise and nations fall. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, we stand strong. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, we have access to your great throne. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have confidence that you hear us today. And we approach you we approach you with adoration. We approach you with praise. We approach you, Heavenly Father, with thanksgiving. We approach you, Father, with the knowledge that you've been merciful to even condescend to hear us today. So bless us. Bless us. Speak to us. Encourage us. Teach us. Heavenly Father, make this time a time where we walk away from this moment, taking something away that will bring honor and glory to your name and giving us strength and courage and boldness to proclaim the wonderful name of Jesus throughout Hattiesburg and those places that you send us. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, you can be seated. Thank you for working with us this morning. As we worship here, Brother Jim Armstrong, the Cary Corral and Orchestra are in Texas at Kyle Kahn's home church. He's the tall young man who sings and plays guitar with us sometimes. But they're at his home church, worshiping there. And they're having technical difficulties, so we need to pray for them this morning. But thank you so much again for worshiping with us. As we bring our sacrifice of praise to the one and only, our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, let's sing Hosanna, Praise is Rising.
Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for this morning and for this time of worship and praise that we can come here together, united as a fellowship and a body, just desiring to worship you and to learn more about you. We hunger for your word. We hunger for more of you. God, we thank you so much for all that you are and all that you've done. Jesus, for that sacrifice you made for us, for raising from the grave and for defeating death and crying out victory for your worship and your glory. Holy Spirit, be present here this morning and lead us in worship. Lead us in worship through the giving of tithes and offerings in this time, God. May we, may we give joyfully, Father, that we can go out and, and share Father, your gospel and your praises that we can come here and worship and gather together, Lord, and sing praises to you. Father, it's in your holy and righteous name, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen. yet Miss Carolyn don't go yet Miss Carolyn come back <laughs> come back <laughs> stand with us as we sing this last song of praise today your name
hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it's closer now than it's ever been I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the call and at the midnight cry we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that remain will be quickly changed and at the midnight cry when Jesus comes again I look around I see prophecies fulfilled and signs of the times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the Father as he says son get your children and at the midnight cry 
Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain changed and at the midnight cry when Jesus comes again and then those that remain will be quickly changed At the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again. At the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again. Jesus comes again. Well, good morning to you. Hey, Amen. Don't you just, I'll tell you, you can hear the trumpet almost, can't you? As I look around and I listen and I see what's going on, I spent part of yesterday, part of yesterday studying the eschatology, the doctrine of last things of the Islamic faith. And you say, well, that's a way to spend your Saturdays. Well, it was this time. And I tell you that even in 2011, 2012, in a survey done among Muslims, the Muslims believe that their Messiah is about to return. Okay? Their Messiah is not our Messiah. I want you to understand that. Uh, their Messiah, in all likelihood, is probably part of the component of the, of the unholy trinity, the beast, the false prophet, um, the antichrist, likely is part of that unholy trinity. And they believe he's about to return any time now. The whole world anticipates something apocalyptic any time now. I can't wait to hear the trumpet sound. I am so ready to hear that trumpet. So ready. It would be wonderful. 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 13 is our text this morning. I want to talk to you about being an overcomer. We're going to read the word of God. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's on the screen behind me. The word of God says this. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. He, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Father, take the truths of these great words and impress them upon our heart with an iron pen, with a diamond point. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love and your mercy in Jesus. And we ask this in his great name. Amen. Now, there are so many truths in this passage of Scripture that we read, but there's something wonderful in this passage that I want to apply and does apply to every single believer in this place today. And this is the truth. You can be an overcomer. You can be an overcomer. The sad truth is many of us are not overcomers. We're overcome by life, by circumstances. But God says you can be an overcomer. God says you should be an overcomer. Don't be like the person who said, well, I can overcome anything out there but temptation. And that's the one thing I cannot overcome. One man said, well, they sing about victory in Jesus, but they live like victims. They don't live like they have victory. Somebody said, we sing how firm a foundation, but we founder like we're standing in quicksand. I want you to know that Jesus says in this passage of Scripture that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. There's a period after that, and there's a reason for that period after that. That's enough said. Nothing else needs to be said. I can't say this enough to you, and I can't speak about this without emphasizing that we face opposition. Just this morning, I read an article about a church, a, a, a ministry, excuse me, in Idaho, a man who was involved and had publicly advertised that he would perform weddings there in Idaho, and now the city in which he lives there in Idaho has said if he won't marry everybody, and you all know what I mean by that, everybody, then he can't marry anybody. And they're fining him. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us in those days before Christ returns, one of the signs of the sure return of Christ is that they will forbid to marry. Ladies and gentlemen, it's happening before our very eyes. If you'll stop and you'll just listen with spiritual ears this morning. Well, we're going to have opposition. We're going to struggle. If you live for Jesus, expect opposition, ladies and gentlemen. And you need opposition. Why? Because you need that to enjoy victory. You need that to understand what it means to be an overcomer. No opposition, no victory. Well, we all know, well, not all of us perhaps, but Southern Miss actually won a ball game yesterday. Isn't that wonderful? 30 to 20, they won a game. I want to tell you a secret about that game. They didn't go out at 2 o'clock in the morning when the other team was not on the field and just run the ball up and down the field. No, sir. 
they went out there against an opponent and they they struggled against an opponent and they overcame their opponent it'd be a worthless victory if the other team were not on the field it's worthless for you if you don't face opposition and face struggle in this life the normal Christian life is a life lived listen to me it's a life lived with overcoming <clears throat> victory if you're a Christian today and you're not living a life with overcoming victory then your life is subnormal not normal if you're being defeated in this life and you call yourself a Christ follower then you're living a subnormal life because whatever is born of God overcomes this world I'm speaking to you about practical victory not positional because I want to tell you something the moment you received Christ you were placed into a position of victory but it doesn't feel like it on a daily basis does it not every day that goes by and so I'm speaking to you about personal and practical victory this morning and I'm going to give you three truths about overcoming victory that are true about every Christ follower present today three truths <clears throat> number one I want to tell you about how your victory is secured it's secured by being born again so you need to ask yourself a question this morning am I truly born again listen to me wake up and listen you need to ask this question am I truly born again well let me give you a question to answer that question with have you recognized your need to be born again now I'm not asking you if you recognize that you're a sinner that you think you've sinned I mean all of us know Romans 3 23 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God I've not met many people that will uh, that will not admit that they've done something in their life that could be considered sinful everybody I meet of all different ages will tell me yes I've done something that's wrong I've done something that's bad but I've met an awful lot of people that think the good things they do outweigh the bad things that they do and therefore their good things are going to get them into heaven and gain them access into heaven. I used to get so angry when I'd go to some funerals that I would attend and I'd sit there and, and I would know some things about the individual laying there in that box you know that uh, that they're about to put into the ground that corpse and they'd say well he's in a better place now well how do you know that well because he did good things he was a good man he did good things or she did wonderful things she was so kind well she was a scoundrel he was a scoundrel they lived a life that, that uh, was unparalleled with, with some of the things and some of the atrocities that they committed. Yeah, but they were good to their family while well, they did it, and that's good enough. You know, you hear that sort of stuff, for lack of a better word, and you hear it and you wonder, what do people really believe these are church going people that are saying that they these church going people uh, are saved by their works I want you to know something that's not true and their your works are not going to get you into heaven the good things you do will not outweigh the bad things that you do imagine standing before a judge and the judge says you're guilty of murder Ah uh, yes, I'm guilty of murder, but I really take good care of my children. I don't beat my wife. I pay my bills on time. I'm honest. I even give to charity. So what's one little thing compared to all the good things I do, Judge? You need to let me off. Why, everybody here would say, no, that's wrong. That's terrible. We can't do that sort of thing but yet there are men and women who absolutely refuse to believe the extent of their sinfulness they do not fall into this category of the exceeding sinfulness of sin 
They don't believe that sort of thing in their lives. So I'm asking you, if you have moved from Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, to Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I'm asking you, if you reach the place where you suddenly feel separated from God, and that if you died, you'd spend eternity in hell, not with God in heaven. I'm asking you that question. I'm asking you, have you come to a place where you've repented of your sin, where you've done that 180? Because it's one thing to recognize you've sinned. It's another thing to come to a place of repentance. Judas recognized that he sinned. But Judas didn't come to a place of repentance. And he died a lost man, described in the Word of God as the son of perdition, because he did not come to a place where he repented of his sin. Do not confuse repentance with regret. Some will change their habits, but not change their heart. And that's a big problem in the world today. Lot's wife left Sodom, but her heart stayed behind. And she turned around, and she fixed her eyes on what she left, because her heart was already there. And that's when she was changed into a pillar of salt. If you have a change of heart, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have a change of habit. Because that's what the word repentance means. It means an internal change that produces external results. Have you had that internal change in your heart, in your life, that produces an external change that other people can see? Have you seen that in your life? And number three, have you come to a place where you received the free gift of eternal life that's found in Christ Jesus alone? The Word of God says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The Word of God says that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become sons, and parentheses there, and daughters of God, even to those who believe on his name. Have you come to that place where you know you're a sinner separated from God, but you've repented of your sin, and you have by an act of faith received the Lord Jesus Christ into your life? Not here in your head, not intellectually, listen to me, not intellectually, but in your heart, wholeheartedly confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, meaning he's your God, he's your master, he's in control of your life, and God raised him from the dead, and he lives in my life. If you come to that place today, if you've come to that place, you're already in a position of victory. Your place is secured. Your victory is secured. I want to tell you, though, not only can your victory be secured, but it can be settled. It can be settled. And I want to tell you how to be settled. It's by your belief. The Bible says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let me tell you something about your victory. It's settled in heaven but it may not necessarily be settled in your heart. The truth is there, but it may not be a truth that you apply personally to your own heart. It's settled by faith for you personally. If you want to have personal victory, here it is in this phrase, your faith, your faith. Your victory comes through your faith, even our faith. That's where it is. Faith is not about believing in spite of the evidence. Somebody thinks faith is blind and it just takes a leap into the dark. It doesn't take a leap into the dark, folks. It takes a walk in the light. That's what faith does. It's a walk in the light of God's Word. And God speaks to you in the Word. And you look at the Word. No, faith is not about believing in spite of the evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of the consequences. Because sometimes... 
what you're going to face in this life is going to be so oppositional, so opposing to what is common and logical in the world that you're going to pay consequences for doing it. It's obeying in spite of the consequences. You see, God said it, so it's settled. But it's not necessarily, as I said, settled in your heart. Larry, you want to know why people don't tithe? You want to know why? They don't tithe because they do not believe that God really will bless them if they do. It's settled in the Word of God that He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you if you'll do that. That's settled in the Word of God. It's the truth of God's Word. It's settled. Period. But they won't do it we won't do it. People who won't tithe will not do it because they really don't believe God will bless them if they do do it. And you think about that. You know why folks have trouble with, with sharing the gospel? You want to know why? Because they're not sure God's really going to be with them. This is one of the reasons. They're not sure God's really there with them when they go and they share the gospel. I want you to know, overcoming victory is enabled and enacted through our faith. There are several things you need to believe this morning. You need to believe about your victory, your identity rather, in Christ Jesus. You remember what we said, saw last week in Romans 3.17? Because, I'm, Romans 3, uh, 1 John 3.17, because as he is, so are we in this world. This is the truth of God's Word for you and me. You are sons and daughters of God. That's what it says in the Scripture. You are a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2.3. You are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a saint of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are salt and you are light. You need to believe about your identity in Christ Jesus. You need to believe about the immutability of Christ. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me tell you something. Jesus doesn't change. The world is changing. There's an article out there about a prominent uh, religious group, a prominent Christian group that's talking about changing their doctrine regarding gays and gay marriage. And there's a big discussion and a near split in this particular church. There was a second article about a prominent evangelical church that originated in Australia but has campuses all over the world. And the pastor, the pastor named Brian Houston said, well, we've got to rethink our position on this issue. And we've got to rethink how we relate to the gay community. And what he's doing is he's setting it up because some of his churches have already begun to receive openly practicing gay members in their church. I'm not even sure I can listen to that group's uh, uh, praise band anymore, man. When I think about that. The world's changing. My Jesus isn't changing. Amen. The world is changing. My God doesn't change. Amen. The world is changing. Access to the Most High God doesn't change. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. No one comes to the Father but by me. You need to believe in the immutability of Christ. You need to believe about the presence of Christ in your life. Lo, I am with you always, Jesus said. His name is Emmanuel. God with us, and he's with us at all times. You need to believe about the power of Christ in you. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My, how we love that phrase until we realize he's talking about doing without so we can give more for God's work. And then we think, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know about this so much anymore. Well, I want you to know something. The truth of God's Word is the truth of God's Word, period. And we need to live by it. And Christ will enable you. Christ will do it. Enoch overcame the passions of this world and he walked with God. Noah overcame the perversion of this world and he worked with God and built an ark. Abraham overcame the prospects of this world and went out with God looking for a city yet to come. Sarah overcame the paralysis of this world when God opened her womb and she conceived at age 90. Moses overcame the power of this world and led Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. When you understand the power of Christ Jesus, it works in you and through you, you will understand what an overcoming Christian you can be and should be in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, in faith, by faith, your victory is settled, period. It's done. And let me give you one more truth about this victory that God's given us, this overcoming victory. And I want you to see how it's been substantiated. And that is found in verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. Now water here uh, that's mentioned here is the baptism at the Jordan beginning at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. The blood is what he did at the end of his earthly ministry there at Calvary. Both of them show this. When he was baptized by John the Baptist, it showed that he identified with man. When he died on the cross, he identified himself through his blood, through his shed blood, with every person present uh, and every person yet to be born in this world. He's identified himself with all of mankind. The blood of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, gives us witness in heaven. And you're saying now, I don't know about that verse there in verse 7. It says there, there are these witnesses in heaven. That's not in my Bible. If you have ESV or NIV or uh, 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 CUV or whatever Vs that you may have at that time, uh, if you have that, it may not be in your text. Well, that's all right. There's nothing untruthful about what's written there about what agrees in heaven and the Father and the Spirit and the Word there witnessing in heaven. There's nothing untruthful about that. But let me tell you about the blood giving witness in heaven because the blood gives witness in heaven. In Hebrews, which you're studying in your morning Bible studies, and the ninth chapter, what chapter y'all up to right now? Chapter 6. Well, that's a good one. That's an interesting chapter. In Hebrews chapter 9, as he talks about the priesthood and he speaks about the priest offering sacrifice, he compares that and says there's a tabernacle and a temple here on earth, but it's only a shadow, it's only a symbol, symbolic of the real deal that's in heaven. And there in heaven there's this great thing, this temple that's there, this this tabernacle that's there, this holy of holies, this most holy place, and there is the ark of God there before, the mercy seat of God. And Jesus Christ, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 24, I believe it is, Jesus Christ, I'll look back at my notes and be sure I'm telling you right, uh, verse 12, Excuse me, in Hebrews 9, 12, Jesus Christ took his blood and he sprinkled his blood in heaven before the mercy seat. And there, that blood was sprinkled to give witness in heaven about his purchasing our salvation here on earth. The blood of Jesus Christ gives witness in heaven, but the blood of Jesus Christ also gives witness in your heart. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, 
mean that we can have more confidence, we can have boldness to enter into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he gives witness in your heart and gives you confidence to approach the throne of Almighty God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, there's that 24 verse that I was looking for a moment ago. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, the Bible says the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And so what is that talking about? The blood of Abel. If you remember in the story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis, when Cain uh, 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 killed his brother, the Bible says, Cain, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, from the earth. And Abel's blood was giving witness of his righteousness. But, listen to me, there's a better blood. There's a righteous blood. There's a pure blood in the Lord Jesus Christ that gives witness in your heart when you repent and believe the gospel message. And that's a witness that God has given to you that shows you that you have overcoming victory in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus not only gives you witness in your heart and not only gives you witness in heaven, the blood of Jesus Christ shows that you are a winner over the forces of hell. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, the word of God tells us in that passage of scripture in Revelation 12, 11, that they overcame him, the devil, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great picture for for you and for me, that God gives us overcoming victory through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Nick, you didn't have any clue I'd be talking about the blood in this message today. You and I didn't speak. But then you brought up what you brought up in, in your reading from Ephesians chapter 2, that we who were afar off were made near, brought near by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I want you to know God designed that for you to hear that, for me to repeat that now. You have victory because the blood of Jesus Jesus brought you into the presence of Almighty God. If it were not for the blood of Jesus Christ, God would say, excuse my hand please, God would say, stay away, stay back. You can't come into my holy presence. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, Almighty God opens his arms to you and says, come to me, come to me. I give you rest. The world has grown more and more paralyzed in these days by an outbreak of a very sinister disease. If you say the E word anywhere in public now, you can be arrested and charged with a felony in many places. A man was in a casino, shouldn't have been there to begin with, but that's another message. A man was in a casino over in Vegas, and he coughed and said, excuse me, I've got Ebola, and they arrested him. Well, folks, we are kind of stupid sometimes. Stupid for saying it, stupid for doing what they did. But we're scared. We're paralyzed by this disease, this hemorrhagic disease. We read about the nurses, the man over in Texas that died, Thomas Duncan. I mentioned him last Sunday night in my, in my uh, study. We read about uh, Thomas Duncan, then we read about Nita Pham, and, and, and uh, I don't know the other nurse's name, excuse me, that has contracted Ebola. And we're, we're hollering and got all of these ideas of how we're going to take care of Ebola and, and what we need to do to take care of Ebola, and we're scared to death of Ebola. The truth of the matter is this, since June, now this is, this is October, so we're talking about July, August, September, October. In a, in a span of, of, of just or about four months now, in a span of four or five months, there have been more than 200 doctors and nurses who have died from Ebola over in Africa. 
doctors and nurses. This is a scary thing, isn't it? They looked at Nita Feynman and they said, we don't know what we're going to be able to do for you. There's a doctor who survived it. His name is Dr. Kent Bradley. He's a Christ follower. He's a believer. And he says, I'll give her some of my blood. And he took some of his blood and he, he went to Dallas, flew to Dallas, took some of his blood and gave it to Nita Feynman. And if you looked yesterday on the news, you saw her sitting up and eating a meal. Her body has already responded to that. Just imagine if Nita Feynman said, no, Dr. Bradley, I want to try this on my own. I don't need your blood. I want to try this on my own. I think I'm strong enough to do it. She surely would have died. No question about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something worse. There's the blood of Jesus that can wash away sin, that gives you access to the throne of God, that gives witness of peace, that shows that you're a winner, that gives you victory over the enemy in your life, over the world. And yet, we look to Jesus and we say, no, nah, I'm just going to do it on my own, Jesus. I'm going to do it on my own. You want to know why you're struggling today? Look to the blood first. Look to the blood first.